Okay, so good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning, depending where you are. Uh, once again, I'm delighted to have this conversation, uh, sort of about freedom themes or inspired by, but a lot of things. And I'm so happy to happy to be joined by Kanga Yamada Taylor, who is my role model when it comes to engaged scholarship and you know, radical history. Uh, in fact, I would argue that she's redeemed the term public intellectual after it had been so thoroughly trashed like 20 years ago. Um, and I'm just grateful that, you know, you found a moment in your busy schedule to speak with me. Now, Kanga, for this crowd, the Haymarket crowd, really needs no um, introduction. Whoops. Needs no introduction, especially uh, most of you have read something of hers, whether it was her writing in New Yorker, the most recent piece uh, on the right wing's attack on Philadelphia progressive DA Larry Krasner, which is excellent. I you know, encourage you to get it right now. Oh, you might have seen her work in Boston Review, Paris, Paris Review, The Guardian, The Nation, Jacobin. Um, you might have read her award winning books such as uh, Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, or Race for Profit, How Banks in the Real Estate Industry Undermine Black Home Ownership. And even if you haven't, uh, you probably have used the term predatory inclusion, which she develops in the book. And if you haven't read the book, but you use predatory inclusion, shame on you. You should, I suggest you read the book immediately after this conversation. Um, it's kind of like, you know, talking about abolition democracy and never reading uh, uh, Black Reconstruction. Others may know her work from How We Get Free, Black Feminism, and the Kumbahi River Collective, which is an indispensable edited text uh, that both reintroduces a new generation to the famous Kumbahi River Collective statement, another one of those texts that are often cited but not always read, uh, and also includes a brilliant introduction by Kanga and wonderful interviews with Barbara and Beverly Smith, Demita Frazier, Elisa Garza, Garza, and commentary by our friend, uh, Barbara Ransby. Now, everyone knows Kanga is a MacArthur Genius Fellow, a Freedom Scholar, a Guggenheim Fellow, and currently the Leon Forrest Professor of African American Studies at Northwestern. Uh, I got to know Leon Forrest a bit before he passed away, an amazing person. And if you're like me, you know all these things. <laughs> You know, because I know all these things because, you know, and you also know that Kianga is a veteran organizer uh, long before she entered academia. Uh, we'll talk about that. And some of you may know her dad, Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, is for me one of the giants of Black urban history and someone I actually learned a lot from over the years. Mm -hmm. So um, that's my introduction. And I want to begin with the most pressing question. I told Kianga ahead of time. This is the most important question to ask right now. And that is, I just noticed that the launch of the new magazine, <laughs> Hammer and Hope, co-edited, founded and co-edited uh, with you know, Kanga and Jen Parker, who, was, who left the New York Times and now you know, together they're, they're uh, co-editing this amazing magazine. Can you talk about that? Because uh, I really want people to know about this magazine and be able to find out like how to get information, to sign up, to read it, to get access, and what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. First, th thank you for that uh, warm, effusive uh, introduction, Robin. And uh, thanks for the invitation to come and talk about politics and talk about freedom dreams and uh, everything connected uh, to that, which is, you know, all the work that we're in, engaged in is how do we change this thing that mm -hmm. we're, we're all stuck in right now. Um, Hammer and Hope, uh, inspired by uh, Robin Kelly's classic uh, Hammer and Ho uh, about the uh, Communist Party organizing in uh, Alabama um, in the, the 1930s. Um, and really about this uh, history um, of black radicalism uh, that, you know, has been um, distorted, has been hidden, has been misunderstood. Um, and so, you know, in, in many ways, 
uh, Hammer and Ho was an, is an inspiration for this project um, that developed out of a series of kind of frustrated texts mm -hmm. between Jen and I um, in, in the uh, that kind of began in the summer of, of 2020 and spilled over into the fall of 2020 um, and then, you know, exploded exponentially um, in the uh, winter of 2021. And I think our frustration was about politics uh, in general. And, you know, we all were kind of uh, both um, inspired and thralled by the historic outpouring um, in the summer of 2020, uh, and then watch that really slowly dissipate into uh, the presidential election that fall, the fall of 2020, into the Georgia Senate races in uh, the winter uh, of 2021, and then into what typically happens. The, we got the Democrats in office, we, you know, staved off fascism, and now we must wait and give them time to, you know, work their, you know, do their work and, and deliver on all the promises. And I feel like there was political frustration there. And then, you know, you want a kind of political analysis and understanding of why this is happening, um, what it means and what we should do about it. And it just didn't, it just didn't exist. And so we, it's literally, you know, the, the thing that Toni Morrison said that we all say to ourselves, you know, we want to write the thing that we want to read and that we can't find. Um, and so this is the a culmination of almost three years of um, uh, discussion and debate and uh, collaboration with comrades, um, Derricka Purnell, uh, Olafemi uh, Taiwo, uh, Astra Taylor, um, Jim uh, Plank from uh, Haymarket, uh, you know, a collaboration among uh, a wide group of uh, uh, comrades, uh, Amna Akbar, um, who's a law professor at Ohio State University, um, to really try to create a, a publication uh, that one, um, reflected the kinds of political concerns issues and debates that we think are uh, critical to have um, right now that was rooted in a political tradition uh, of radical politics, uh, of uh, forward lookingness of, of, you know, not just complaining about the status quo, but uh, analysis, uh, analyzing the contemporary and current situation, both through the lens of history. Um, but also with a, a forward-looking perspective of not just what's wrong, but what do we do? And and in the spirit of freedom dreams, what is the world that we are trying to uh, to create? And so not just reactive and and stuck in our current um, situation. And I think importantly, we want it to <clears throat> we want to capture. Uh, the experiences, the voices of ordinary people on the ground um, who are doing uh, this work. Um, so, you know, we don't need another, uh, you know, forum for uh, intellectuals, for, you know, the um, public intellectuals, the talking heads. And, and that that realm is fine. But we want to bring the, the perspectives of uh, people who are on the ground, um, organizing, experiencing, uh, hoping and wishing and fighting for a different kind of um, reality. And so this is a forum that we think can bring together uh, politics, history, but also uh, the cultural aspect of this, which again, um, you know, you certainly speak very clearly to um, in, in, in freedom dreams, that this is not just about, you know, the, a particular political line, um, a particular ideology, uh, but, you know, we need to um, uh, know what poets have to say uh, about um, the world as it is and the world as it could be. Uh, we need to see what visual artists um, are 
communicating through their work uh, to articulate um, a, a certain understanding of our contemporary situation, but how uh, it could be different. So we see this as a magazine of politics, culture, struggle. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an experiment in some ways. It literally is the thing that we were desperate to see and to read and to engage with um, in during the most you know politically tumultuous period um, in in contemporary American history, um, and so you know if in some small way we can uh, create a space for people to uh, think about and engage with these um, ideas, you know then it will have been successful. But that that's kind of the the context and the motivation. Um, for how we have uh, come up with this project uh, that we just talked about uh, or just sort of launched into the uh, the hemisphere um, today. Uh, right. So you can check out, uh, it's called Hammer and Hope. Um, there's a website where uh, folks can sign up uh, to put their email in. It's going to be our intention. And the reality is that this will be free. Um, we don't believe that you can put political ideas behind a paywall. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to do the, the heavy lifting of doing the fundraising to um, make sure that uh, happens. So if you sign up and give us your email, um, then you can expect to uh, get uh, this publication, um, which we're shooting to launch um, in January. So that's those are the the, the kind of brass tacks uh of this but that's you know we're excited about it that's that's great i'm very excited about it in fact um just to remind people i know john will probably find the the web uh link and uh find the link and put it in the chat for people um that for for projects like this especially ones where there won't be a paywall it's very important for those of us who can to support it financially you know to it's like it's like public television, right? Well, not like public television, <laughs> I but it's better, and it's it's in and it's really unlike any other. We have a we have a a, 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 a flurry of of left publications that are out there in circulation, and they're all very useful, and 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 and, and they benefit us in many ways. But this is unique. This you know it reminds me a lot of Paul Robeson and Lorraine Hansberry's vision of Freedom Magazine, you know, which eventually became Freedom Ways Absolutely. at some point. But it's like that, like, you know, you really, it's, it has a, a certain sense of urgency and connects people in motion and movements with people who are like writers and artists who are also connected and dedicated to trying to change the circumstance. So. Anyway, so thank you for that, and just make sure people support it. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I know, I know. Um, you know, Anthony gave me a hard time about you know we got to talk about freedom dreams, but let me let me begin with a question which I've been dying to ask you. We just you know we're always so busy that we you and I we talk more like on these public forums than just like oh. hanging out. <laughs> we're okay. always running, running. Coming to L.A. I, yeah, well, you come. Well, you you come to LA soon. I'm coming in in February to UCLA, February fifteenth, and I'll be there for about ten days. Oh, good. Well, then we'll we'll definitely hang out. I I didn't even know about. I'm on leave, so I don't know what's going on. All I know is that um, UCLA is is in solid. You know, the students are in strike across the UC yes. system. Yes. It is an amazing thing to see the level of solidarity, and this is the first time in my 35, 36 years of doing this, that I've seen so much faculty support mm. for graduate students. Cause that's not, that has not been the case in the past. And we could talk about that, but let me, let's go back. So this is a question I want to ask you. Um, you know, when I wrote uh, Freedom Dreams and then went back and, you know, did the 20th anniversary um, edition, new introduction, you know, I emphasize the context, like what the context was, and really the context was like late 90s, yep. early 2000s. And, you know, you and I, our paths crossed, you know, I remember seeing you at, uh, at the Black Radical Congress, 
Yep. Uh, and it was a very important moment for us. So I'm really curious to know um, how you, like what, what was your assessment then of what was happening? Um, how did you understand the, the context and the possibilities? And were you at all disappointed? Were you optimistic about things? I'm just curious to know your take on that period and, and also how it shaped your current work. That's a, that's a, that's a great question. And I actually, you know, thinking about it, um, later when I was writing, uh, my first book from Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, um, I thought hard about, um, that period, um, and of the, the late 90, the late nineties and the early aughts, um, in, in some ways, because I was trying to, um, understand and help create a lineage uh, for people for Black Lives Matter um, and a, a kind of uh, historical trajectory that I think in some ways explained why the movement uh, was so explosive and that it had to do with the, um, the suppression uh, of an earlier movement. And so Thinking back, um, you know, and trying to do that, the late 90s was in some ways a, a kind of pre-period of political uh, awakening. Um, and so, you know, if you think about the explosion of the globalization movement, um, the battle in Seattle in 1999, uh, and really the the kind of explosive uh, takeoff of that movement was happening at the same time that the black movement was finally kind of regaining its legs after, uh, of course there was a LA rebellion in 1992, um, but unlike what happened in response to uh, the rebellions of the 1960s, uh, the LA rebellion was met with the the, the crime bill um, of 1994, and really the consolidation of the Democratic Party around the politics of law and order, um, and a, a complete um, uh, suppression in some ways of the potential of, of that movement because of of uh, the the uprising in Los Angeles, which, which was different. Um, in many ways, from the rebellions uh, of the 1960s, in is multiracial um, in character, which a lot of people, uh, you know, didn't recognize or don't think about because of the way that uh, mass state violence was rationalized by racializing uh, the the rebellion. But the the LA rebellion was a multiracial uprising coming in um, not only response to police abuse and violence, but also uh, the uh, economic recession of the, the late 1980s, which also gets papered over because of this love affair uh, with Ronald Reagan and the, the mistaken um, idea that Reaganomics um, was some kind of innovative uh, um, economic intervention that uh, created, you know, wealth and prosperity across the country. It, it created uh, hardship and inequality um, in unparalleled ways, which contributed um, to the, the the drug war, uh, to the drug economy, um, and then to the repressive crackdown. Uh, and so that was met with even more state repression in the form of of the the, the crime bill. And so it was really later in the the 1990s, I think, partly in reaction to that kind of state onslaught and the the mobilization of the uh, black political class uh, around the the politics of crime and punishment um, and the the suppression really of um, any kind of organized resistance to that that begins to break up around racial profiling um, in the late 1990s and so this phenomenon of driving while black, uh, becomes um, an important kind of touchstone in the reemergence of uh, black politics um, and the politics of resistance. 
And, you know, it's significant enough that Bill Clinton convenes this idiotic initiative called the Conversation on Race um, in the in the country to talk about racial progress um, in the U.S. But the the racial profiling touched a nerve uh, across Black America because it was an experience that the vast majority of Black people uh, could identify with. Um, and that you know, begins to take shape organizationally. And so when you have the um, assassination of Amadou Diallo uh, uh, in New York, the um, rape and uh, beating of Abner Louima um, uh, in New York in the late 1990s, this, these become uh, sites of, of protest, and not just for New York, but they become uh, a touchstone for uh, anti-racist organizing and, and black people uh, across the country. Um, and so there, it's, there's, there's a tremendous moment of hope, which I think is part of the context within which the BRC, the Black Radical Congress, um, is, is initiated. That here in 1998, here is a moment where it's clear there is the need for some kind of political intervention and direction because you have much more uh, consolidation of the black uh, political class by the late 1990s than anything that existed in um, the late uh, 1960s or the early 70s when there was enough of a radical movement uh, that, and, and these black elected officials were new enough uh, to uh, electoral politics um, that they hadn't quite figured out, you know, how to to be. They weren't entrenched. Um, they, you know, they weren't senior uh, 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 officials, and their legitimacy came from their connection uh, to the communities. And the communities were entrenched in in movement, and so they had to reflect that to some degree. This is totally different. Um, by the late 1990s. And so there's an important political opening that the BRC tries to um, uh, inject itself into. Uh, and you can see the tremendous potential of that just based on the gathering um, in Chicago alone. I forget how how big that was, right? That it was it was, it was enormous. It was yeah, it was two thousand people. Yeah, it was two thousand people um, at the University of Illinois Chicago, um, and you know, it really felt like um, between the globalization movement and uh, the uh, emergence of um, a different kind of black politics, a, a, a radical um, potential in black politics that we were about to have um, a serious turn. And then what happened? What happened was you were writing your epilogue of Freedom Dreams and the towers came tumbling down. Exactly. And when the towers came tumbling down, all of that went tumbling with it. And the legitimacy of the American state came back a hundredfold. The legitimacy of racial profiling. I mean, people have to, it's hard to articulate, right? Like. The whole like driving while black, the there was a movement emerging against racial profiling. Mm -hmm. This specific tactic destroyed because now the state needed racial profiling to find the Arab terrorist among us. And so now you have black people. I mean, there are polls. I, I wrote about this in the book. Black people who six months earlier you know, 85% opposed to this practice of racial profiling. Now 85% for it, um, because now it's directed at Arabs. For black people, it was short lived, right? Like within a month, the, the numbers went back because you could clearly see how this was being um, used and how, you know, it, it's being used to terrorize Arabs and Muslims, but it's also legitimizing this practice that is also now continuing to be used against um, against black people. But the, the Patriot Act, the whole thing, means that all of this organizing that has gone on to uh, uh, show what the excesses of the crime bill from 1994 had produced is, is, is in some ways washed away 
you know, and things are never completely washed away. There's always a residue and people remember so that when movements reorient themselves or reappear, those lessons come with them. But in the immediacy of the moment, it was frightening. I mean, you've got, you know, Congress singing patriotic songs and giving the the state led by George W. Bush a blank check, a blank check. So I have, you know, it's 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 tragic. And I think that we were on the verge of a Black Lives Matter movement in the 1999, 2000, Mm -hmm. 2001, because you had the uh, Amadou Diallo, and then you had Timothy Smith right, t- in, yeah, yeah. in Cincinnati, which was a foreshadowing of what was to come later, right? An uprising in Cincinnati, uh, Ohio, was a foreshadowing of what was to come. So you could see the, the constitutive elements of what became the Black Lives Matter rebellion in Ferguson and then Baltimore. You could see its roots and right. its possibility in the late 90s, in the, the, the early aughts, and is destroyed by yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, Cincinnati was, was kind of an epicenter. I, I remember that so clearly. Um, it was Timothy Thomas. And, Tim- um, right. and, he, and what's interesting, that's April 2001. That's right, it's just yes. months. Yes. In fact, April 2001, the Patriot Act was being debated. This Patriot Act, of course, as you know, was being debated before there was 9-11. Yes. 9-11 was the perfect pretext uh, for them to actually push it through and make it more draconian, but you're so right. And you know, I'm so glad you mentioned um, the, the sense of optimism because I, you know, I don't always mention that, that you know, almost all those folks who were in the leadership of BRC had either participated in, Gar- in the Gary Convention mm-hmm earlier on or had or had been involved in the two big organizations, yes. uh, NBIP um, and NBUF, National Black Independent Political Party, National Black United Front. And, you know, and I remember those early, early meetings, you know, with, you know, Bill Fletcher and Barbara and Manning and Leith and all the people around thinking, okay, th- our time is up. Our, our time has come, rather, not up. Our time has come for a different Black politics, just like you say, yeah. because coming out of the, the Rainbow Coalition struggles with uh, Jesse Jackson, the ADA campaign, which was much more mainstream, though it still was far more radical than <laughs> anything that's come since. Um, and then here in Washington, mm. so you have this moment where um, you have a Black political class that is either, you know, trying to get a, a, a deal with George H. W. Bush in trying to move Republican and or those who are Democrats who are very mainstream Democrats. Yeah. And then this opening for a different kind of progressive politics and and that was and that was crushed. I mean, not like you say, not entirely. Um, but but the one thing I want to mention about Cincinnati, because you know, you brought up uh, the um, anti-globalization movement and, and I'm writing about Cincinnati in this book I'm trying to finish. And, you know, one of the things that was was really interesting was like right before uh, his killing, Cincinnati was hosting one of those, um, uh, I don't know if it's not G7, but one of those kind of globalization, you know, uh, gatherings and had a lot of anti-globalization activists and organizers coming out. Some of them were um, uh, uh Black bloc, you know, anarchists and others in Cincinnati. You know, same people were also showing up, at least at the edges of what was a black rebellion in Cincinnati. And they made these connections. Uh, labor made a connection. Um, and so there was a lot of interesting left organizing uh, and debates about like how to participate uh, in that moment. But it was. People should. It, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Elizabeth um, Hinton's book, America on Fire, because right. it's, it's actually one of the, might be one of the only um, uh, books that talks about what happened in Cincinnati and situates it uh, politically into, you know, the kind of um, continuation of uh, Black rebellion in mm-hmm. response 
uh, to police terrorism in, in black communities. Absolutely. No, I definitely would suggest that. Um, and so to go back again, um, oh, by the way, the conversation on race, remember, was John Hope Franklin who got pulled into that mess. <laughs> and, and he had the, um, the dignity and wherewithal to say, you know what? I don't think so. Right. <laughs> no. um, it, it was but, the deepest kind of deflection. I mean, there's so many things that were happening, right? Like there's the conversation on race. There is, you know, Bill Clinton goes to Africa and the, 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 the burning question is, will he apologize for slavery? You know, and so all of this is happening because the black movement is being reinvigorated after being violently suppressed in LA and then uh, caged with the, the, um, uh, the, the crime bill. And, you know, it wasn't, it, people were not in tune to what was happening then. It, it is crazy. It's, you get the crime bill in 94, you've got the, the, I can't even remember in 96, the death penalty reinforcement, make it stronger act. You know, you get John DeLillo's uh, horrible paper on um, black super predators uh, and, and the paper that begins, well, crime's going down, but don't get too comfortable because there's these black children, you know, I don't think he, did he name them as black or was that Hillary Clinton's not saying who they were, but these unrepentant children who we have to you know, make heal like dogs. I mean, this is what was going on. And so by the, the this was 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, you know, there was an opening that cracked, that an opening that cracked up um, because people started to uh, resist this kind of wanton abuse uh, of black civil rights through racial profiling. And, you know, as irritating as this person is, um, Al Sharpton, you know, was was really uh, an important figure in uh, leading um, protest and, and marches that were relatively small, but that took up this issue uh, uh, of racial profiling um, until it cracked open as a much bigger issue uh, and, you know, became an important site of, of protest that people then immediately linked um, to the killing of unarmed black men. Um, there was a link between the kind of suspicion that uh, black men in particular on the streets were being held in um, and that as a justification for uh, their abuse and murder by the police. So that. So let me ask you a question about um, opportunities possibly lost. Because we just, together, we just laid out um, all these possibilities. And of course, 9-11 was certainly a factor. Uh, and we both know that, um, I think it was 1996, 95, 96, 95, when um, you had this left plank that takes over the AFL-CIO leadership, mm -hmm. um, John Sweeney, and, you yep. know, uh, and 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 Bill Fletcher ends up being really the I think, director of uh, I think it was education, or he he he's a really insignificant figure in that in that group. Um, was there an opportunity for for labor for a real strong labor, you know? racial justice coalition, was that lost? And then I asked this question for a reason because, um, and I'm not trying to be nostalgic here, but I, you know, being in New York City, because uh, I know you actually came to, you, you were in Illinois and went to New York for a while, then you went back. And came, I don't know what years you were in New York in those days, but being in New York after the Black Radical Congress was formed and then it split, and it split, you know, and be, because I just make friends with all kinds of people, I was friends with both sides. You know? <laughs> but there was like a social democratic side, yep. um, you know, Manning. And, and then there was um, 
what some people I think mistakenly call nationalists, uh, but they were they weren't exactly national. They were basically mostly labor people. Um, mm. I remember, remember Sam Anderson and um, a bunch of people were, and, and it's not that there was a, a significant split over big ideological issues. I don't really understand, understand it fully, but one side seemed to have deep ties with the labor movement in New York City. The other side had deep ties with academia and other social movements. Uh, and that, that split, I know, I felt like was such a loss. And it reflected something in, in the inability of labor and this other element of left to kind of come together, especially when Columbia University, they had that, the, all these meetings around the formation of the organization Sausage, which terrible acronym. It's like, you know, scholars and artists, writers for social justice, which was supposed to be like the labor arm. Um, and I got myself in trouble. That's another story, you know, for its, for its it time, always, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering if what, you know, given, especially given your, your knowledge of, of being inside the left, of seeing what you saw, was that a lost opportunity? And if not, what do you think could have happened? Or you know, have? lost opportunity. I don't know. I was there an, an opportunity. There was an opportunity, but I don't know if these things are 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 lost. But if there's something more fundamental, um, and what I'll say about the the opportunity is that. There's a, a larger kind of political dynamic um, at play, which is by the late 90s, um, the American economy is booming, right? Bill Clinton is extremely popular. And the problem, though, is that, you know, it's, it's an economy that is not working um, for everyone. Uh, and so this was most powerfully demonstrated by the 1997 UPS strike. Uh, which is another forgotten um, uh, detail of, of, of history. And the kind of underlying theme of that strike was part-time America won't work. Um, and so UPS, tremendously wealthy corporation, um, is essentially getting away with uh, uh, overloading its workforce with part-time workers so that they don't have to pay benefits um, that workers who are basically um, on a contingent, you know, contingent basis. And you, we see many kind of uh, uh, resonances of, of that uh, on college campuses and the, um, the over-reliance on contingent labor uh, to avoid paying benefits, to avoid um, uh, long-term commitments um, to, you know, to, to these workers. And so it exposed the um, kind of underbelly of what was perceived as this historically hot um, economy. And when that was coupled with uh, the globalization movement, uh, which was an attempt to, you know, really look at uh, the ravages of capitalism in, the, in and across the global South, um, and combined with the um, attacks on uh, African Americans uh, through racial profiling and wanton police abuse. I mean, that was Giuliani's uh, when he was mayor of New York. That was the whole strategy: was to intimidate and brutalize black people. Um, that was uh, the strategy of uh, that that kind of underpinned what he described as the qual quality of life uh, uh, campaign um, to retake the streets of New York. And so, yeah, there was an opportunity to distill those kind of disparate but overlapping uh, expressions of political discontent, um, uh, of a desire for things to be different into organization. But then we have to grapple with the kind of historical questions that have always undermined that. 
And the most crucial one, um, especially when it comes to the labor movement, is what is the relationship between the labor, you know, trade union leadership, um, the black movement leadership, uh, and the Democratic Party? What is the relationship between these two? Um, uh, or between these different entities. And that, you know, is the question today. Um, it was the, the, the question then. And I think that it was um, the failure to, to really engage that question in a serious way, meaning how do we uh, uh, get beyond this crisis of the Republican Party, and I think it's it's the seeds of Trumpism, right? I mean, we can look far back to find the, the seeds of Trumpism, but the kind of modern shock, um, cartoonish buffoonery and racism of the the uh, the Republican Party, in some ways, you can see with Newt Gingrich, right, and the the contract uh, on America with America. Um, and and so the Democrats have always been adept, at least in the modern age, in the last 40 years, of pointing to the increasing, you know, frightening disposition of the Republican Party to say, you can either get on board with us or you're going to have to deal with that. And our movements have collapsed around this this question, and we can dress it up and you know with critiques and and all the rest of it. But look at I mean, look at 2020, right? The most powerful protest in American history that forced Joe Biden to go from saying in the fall of 2019, not much will change with me to by the summer of 2020, when the DNC convened for the Democrats' national convention, everything had changed. Joe Biden had a laundry list of goods the length of his body that he was now willing to sign on to in order to get the energy from the streets to the polls. Okay, and so you have like the, various kind of self-appointed leadership out of this who agree to that in some form or another. And so we go from these historic protests to not a peep. Joe Biden, I mean, the most banal, right? Police reform, something, anything. Sign this toothless George Floyd bill, nothing, right? Like we got Juneteenth, which I think, I actually think is important, but we got Juneteenth and we got an anti-lynching bill. Right. You got Eric Adams too. With the modern world. <laughs> and that's what we got. And not a peep. Right. Right. Not a not a picket sign, not a, a roving circle of pro nothing. Nothing. Silence. Exactly. And that's exactly. that's that's the bargain with the devil. And so yeah. If, if you feel that tension now with 26 million people in the streets, then you most certainly felt it in 1996, 1997, with there were people in the streets, there were lots of people in the streets, but we have this, this horror show, which has become even more horrible and frightening and dangerous in the Republican Party, that works as a discipline for everyone to curb your critiques. You know, you can go on Twitter and insult people till your fingers bleed, and then we fall in line. And I'm not saying that I have a, a solution to that because the, the cost of losing has gotten so exponentially high. What does it mean? And this is why I think the left today is so cavalier, you know, and not thinking this through. So this is a hard question. This isn't an mm -hmm. easy right. question, because what does it mean if the Republicans were to have the House, the Senate and the presidency? Right. Like what 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 does it mean? And so 
it means some bad shit. And but that's that's the that's the that is the conundrum. And it was in the late 90s and I think that is what you know stops the the formation um of truly in the, the the formation of truly independent uh uh politics and and there is a desire for it we saw it in the nader campaign right in 2000 there is a deep desire for it and and then you know when it starts to get more real like with the nader campaign or like with bernie sanders you know the the teeth get sharp the knives come out democrats in in the leadership and republicans find themselves allied in in strange ways to, you know, keep keep the party just for themselves, and so these are these are tough historical problems to to overcome. So this is just a long way of saying that it's not just missed opportunities and missed chances and roads not taken, um, but this question, this has been the central question I think since the. Um, the the post civil rights um, post black insurgency moment when black people were finally allowed into uh, uh, electoral politics um, is what is the basis of our you know independent political organizing when it's in alliance with the Democratic Party this poses you know this poses big challenges and big big questions that our our politics collapse through right, every right. electoral cycle. Right. Yeah, no, it's, I think that's true. And, and in fact, um, there may not be missed opportunities, but there's some lessons mm. that we could probably take from this. You know, I, I, um, before we talk about the present and then we're gonna go to the final thing, um, I did wanna hold up one, cause you mentioned the UPS strike, which I think is important for people to remember that. Um, the other thing that was going on, you know, one of the people I knew who was part of the um, uh, the the other, I guess it was a BRC Metro, but the the BRC the I call it the Labor Nationalist contingent mm -hmm. was Tim Skirmerhorn, who just oh, passed yeah. away. Yeah. Tim yeah. just passed away, uh, I think in September. And Tim yeah. was amazing because he was in the leadership of the Transport Workers Union, and they were the ones that were fighting the Clinton administration and their workfare policies that were basically um, forcing uh, 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 people on, on public assistance to clean trains for non-union wages. And they're fighting this fight. You know, and there's so many important lessons in that moment where um, the, the, the labor movement of mobilized can fight these fights that are not necessarily just only about uh, workplace organizing or wages and you know benefits, but also confront the state and its policies that are undermining not just labor, but you know ending the the social wage and 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 the welfare state, you know, which we saw that erodes. But but let's just you know um, I, I want to open up. I know we're go, we're going to end soon, but let's talk about the present. You know, let's talk about the, what it means for people, um, even for us to celebrate as if this is such a great, great victory, um, the recent midterm elections, uh, the Democratic Party as, you know, the only game in town. Uh, the same Democratic Party has given us at the municipal level um, Eric Adams, Mm -hmm. I think, I, I, you know, um, uh, Naomi Murakawa gave this brilliant talk uh, recently at the um, uh, at a um, uh, symposium for Ruth Wilson Gilmore in, in her work. And it was really talking about all these black mayors, uh, Lori Lightfoot, you know, which in the city you're about to <laughs> settle in. I mean, these are disasters in terms of not just rolling yeah. back. The, some of the progress made around just the discourse around policing, but you know more police, you know m more carceral um, uh, responses, uh, the, you know playing on the, the so-called crime wave, crime fears, and which are real. But you know the so how do we, you know I can understand 
moments when the Democratic Party can be a means for certain candidates and certain things to happen at a very local level, but to be so beholden to a party that has not really been uh, our friend. <laughs> you know? well, I mean, what's, what's your take on some of this? I mean, it's it's even worse than that because they they often like Eric Adams, you know, is is he's not single handedly responsible for initiating uh, the this crime panic, um, but he's he's in the top two maybe. You know, like I think that as a as a political strategy. Um, I think the Republican Party took um, took him as as uh, as an example, as a lead on how to 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 frame this, because he um, immediately, as a way to both justify the way that he wanted to apportion um, municipal funds, um, to uh, justify reestablishing. Um, a role for the police that had be, become um, intensely scrutinized, you know, and not just because of the the 2020 protests. I mean, New York, like this is a this is 10 years of Black Lives Matter, and it's an even longer um, history in in New York with campaigns and fighting against um, racial profiling, against stop and frisk. Yeah, I mean. When when hasn't there? I was in New York from '92 uh, to '98. You know, in the entirety from the time I got there, and there was the the cop riot against Dinkins um, at City Hall to the time I left when we were marching across the the Brooklyn Bridge um, for Abner Louima. Like the entirety of that time was about police terrorism. I lived in the 30th precinct, and we called it the Dirty 30. And I knew personally. Um, about the, you know, in my building, you couldn't walk up the stairs without the crunch of crack vials um, under your feet. And there were cops in and out of uh, the, in and out of our building. And, you know, so, which is just to say that there's a long history um, of anti-police uh, brutality and anti-police, to be honest, organizing. Um, in, in New York City. And so part of what Eric Adams, part of the, the, the support for his, um, uh, his candidacy and his mayor, mayorality has been to re-legitimize the, the police. And part of that is speaking out as a former cop, but it's also um, stoking a crime panic. Uh, and, and, you know, the statistics, people are afraid of, of crime. And the statistics bear out that the, the issues with crime most places nationally peaked in 2021. And that in fact, um, since you know 2021, throughout 2022, it's not clear yet, um, but they have not matched the, the same escalation that took place uh, in 2020 and 2021. And yet the media follows like a lapdog, uh, the, you know, every utterance of someone like Eric Adams, um, and then the Republicans who made a very conscious decision uh, to make this a focal point of um, their campaigns. And so when I wrote about this, it was only to say that I think you know, it was interesting at the very least that given historic patterns where Republicans and Democrats alike have been very successful, not just instigating crime panics um, and crime hysteria, but then uh, have been successful in using those as electoral strategies uh, to win. And that, for the most part, didn't work this time. It worked in some places in um, the Wisconsin uh, Senate race uh, that pit Ron Johnson, uh, who is you know a racist megalomaniac um, in the Republican Party, uh, against Mandela Barnes. You know, you, you run as a black man in in Wisconsin with the name Mandela. You know, that's 
that's a challenge unto itself. And he was, you know, he was hanging in there for a while and leading in the polls. And then, you know, the 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 crime drum uh, was was being beat uh, very loud. Um, and then New York, uh, of course, which has been the the object of a lot of uh, analysis, lost four congressional seats, and um, the kind of panic around ending cash bail uh, has been, um, you know, an important story in in those situations. Uh, so it's not to say that you know we've sort of turned some page and and, and moved on, but I do think that there is such a quickness to um, say that if the movement is not in the streets, right, that it has just gone away. And, and you know, 2020 came, it went, now we're on to the next thing. It's like, no, no, the 2020, if we see it in some ways as a culmination of 10 years of organizing and activism, a lot of which has been political, and not just you know in the streets and, and and marching, but engaging in an ideological war about racism, systemic racism, its relationship to the criminal justice system, the whole discussion, debate, argument about defund the police is about how do we effectively deal with the social disorder that inevitably is produced in a society that is as deeply unequal as the one that we live in, right? And so even if you don't like defund the police, as most black people don't, right? Even if you reject that as a slogan or as an objective, you have now been forced to engage with the, 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 the politics of that, which is how do we stop crime, right? Like, is it more effective to invest in mental health programs? Is it more effective to create jobs programs? You know, what are the more effective ways to deal with this? So you get actually contradictory um, responses of that. People feel like, well, no, we need more police because police will keep us safe on the one hand, but we should have jobs programs. We should have investments in our public schools. And for the first time in a very long time, because of the movement, You've had front page articles discussing the municipal budget. And why do the cops get so much of it? Why do the police in fucking Los Angeles get 50% of the local budget? It's crazy. When you've got you've got homeless people, you've got thousands of homeless people on the streets and the cops are getting half of the municipal budget. And so for the first time, these are things are on the front pages of the newspaper. And we would be remiss to think that after 10 years of discussing this and that discussion becoming most acute and sharp in the summer of 2020, that has had no impact, right? That it's just, it's the same old playbook that they can just roll out. And so, you know, there has to be more done, right? Like those ideas, part of the, the tragedy to me about 2020, is that we still don't have the the kinds of organizations that we need to take some of the ideas that were raised within that context and act on them. Yes, we have a proliferation of small organizations that do important good work, but we don't have any of the large muscular coalitions um, that I think are necessary to have a much broader reach that has clear entry points for the thousands of people who were radicalized and activated uh, to, to join something, to be involved in something. And so that part has not been figured out, but the movement did, has done a tremendous amount to raise questions to destabilize the stability of the ground we all thought we were standing on, um, to raise existential uh, uh, questions. And this, this is an important part in radicalization and social transformation, is raising those questions and what is going on and, and to not just accept surface explanations, right? This is Ella Baker and Angela Davis always 
what is the root? What is underneath? Not just accepting what we're told, not having a surface level understanding of things. What is underneath that is really at root of what is going on? Right, so right. that's, you know. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm totally with you on that. And, um, and and I know that there's no way that Karen Bass would have won uh, without the movement and what has happened on the ground. Because, um, you know, uh, Rick Caruso had a lot of support, you know, from the established, entrenched middle class. Um, yeah. So let's, let's, I know our time's almost over. I'm wondering. Uh, I, want, I want to ask you one question. Okay. And we can um, also take questions from the audience if they want, because we've got about 10 minutes. Okay, so it's been 20 years. Freedom Dreams has been reissued into the, the atmosphere. Um, what, I, I want you to talk about what is, what's different for you now? Like why, you know, the, the book could have come and gone and, you know, why, why is this important? What, what is, is, what can Freedom Dreams bring into these discussions that are, are still going on and, and in some ways feel even more urgent and, and critical? You know, we're talking about fascism and not, you know, in, in a cavalier, in a, not in a cavalier way, but in a, in a serious way. Um, and so what is that, what is the book bringing to us uh, in this political moment that may have been different than, um, than 20 years ago? Right, no, that's a really good question. And I do think that fascism is a very important context, both within the United States and, and globally, though we've seen some amazing reversals, especially in Latin America. Um, or these temporary reversals, we'll see what happens. But, you know, we, f for me at least, uh, and the reason why I wanted to reissue the book was because over the last 20 years, I saw some of the, um, the basic arguments and claims I was making uh, come to life, as it were, you know, where, and I'm not talking about just, you know, using the language of freedom dreams, but but really like in the introduction is called um, from noun to verb, but the practice mm -hmm. of being really self-conscious about, you know, I don't want to call it the long game because it's not the long game. It's basically how, you know, how movements do struggle, develop a, a not just a critique, but a model for the world they're trying to create. And of course, that's not the new thing. That, that's been going on. That's the whole point of the book. It's always been going on. But there's a kind of um, urgency for that model precisely because we're dealing with fascism. Mm. You know, so I, you know, the, 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 the argument that I made in Freedom Dreams was never, ever that, you know, in, t in great times, that we need to be optimistic and that optimism somehow generates these ideas. Optimism does not generate these ideas. In fact, on the contrary, it's the opposite. It's, it's hmm. the, the pessimism, um, it's like Gramsci says, you know, pessimism, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, meaning that we don't really have the luxury not to fight big, because you can't, because under the fascist conditions we're dealing with, you can't chip away at that. Um, we're talking about death dealing policies and practices and structures that can't be reformed away to avoid premature death. We've got to figure out a way to, to confront them head on for our own survival. Mm. And not just black people, but just as a, as a, as a, as a planet. Right. Um, and so, one of the things I learned over the years was how much, um, like how much I how much I didn't deal with, but how how expansive in many ways um, the political visions have become. I mean, uh, the term abolition, for example, was in circulation. You know, 
in circulation in, it was all, of course, the circulation in the 19th century, but circulation in the way that it, 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 it has meaning today in the late 90s or the 2000s. Um, but I, I'll never forget being at Princeton University at the Black Lives, uh, no, the, um, uh, the Race Matters Conference mm. and hearing uh, Angela Davis give this powerful speech about why we need to, why prisons are obsolete. Yep. This is a long time ago. And the, the, you could hear a pin drop. And then after she gave this beautiful speech and powerful speech and persuasive one, all these, you know, young black Princeton students like, well, what do we do with the criminals? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And, and they were all like pushing back. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, there's some pushback, but not the same way at all. I mean, it's become a kind of a common sense. Um, and I think about the editorial board of Hammer and Hope mm -hmm. and what it represents in terms of a far more expansive understanding of sexuality and gender, of class and class dynamics. I'm sorry, they're, trying, they're doing um, some stuff outside and, and, I, and he doesn't care. Um, <laughs> And so I, I, I think, you know, that's why in the introduction I talk about all the areas that I wish I had explored, but it's never too late. I mean, thinking about um, disability justice, thinking mm -hmm. about uh, mutual aid in ways that are not uh, taking the state off the hook, thinking about decolonization and indigenous struggles, which are not just against a climate catastrophe, but really to reorient our relationship to the planet as a whole. So all these things to me open up a path, which I just sit back, I watch it. You know, I watch all these people go, go way past anything I had to say in that book. And by the way, um, for people who haven't read the book, the book is not like my prognosis. I'm really trying to deal with the historical sort of um, precedents the trajectories of movements um, as a historian, you know. So anyway, uh, I know I know we got like about four minutes. So I'm wondering if anyone has a John would know this. If anyone has a question uh, for 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 Kianga especially, um, you know, or anything if you think is oh yeah, there we go. Um, there is a question. Okay. Um, how can we better bring together red and green revolutionary thinking? Do you see some combination of academia and political organi organizations as the way to get properly involved with efforts? And that's a question definitely for you. Um, academia, I mean, I think, you know, uh, I think the, the, well, there there are two parts to this. One, the academy is is not some kind of sacrosanct space where we get to luxuriate in interesting ideas and you know um, have interesting dialogues. It's it's a site of struggle. Uh, you know, there are what is it, forty eight thousand um, graduate workers uh, in the UC University of California system. Uh, right now who are, are striking um, to, you know, uh, for uh, you, the right to, to collectively bargain um, with the, uh, the administration on the various campuses um, as labor. And this is a phenomenon that has been happening uh, at colleges and universities uh, across the, the, the country, um, especially as at, at state schools in particular, uh, where there's this disproportionate use of, um, as we mentioned before, contingent labor, adjunct labor, um, uh, professors in name, word, deed, and labor, uh, but who do not get the same um, uh, access, the same kinds of work protection uh, and job protection that uh, tenure track or tenured professors uh, receive. And so, you know, college campuses increasingly, especially, you know, today, where many of them are um, uh, 
taking on a much more corporate character, fundraising, appealing to corporate America uh, to, you know, for all sorts of financial reasons um, that, you know, these are places uh, uh, of, of, of struggle. And so I think that um, because of that, there is a way in which, you know, people who are uh, involved in those struggles and connected to them uh, bring a certain uh, set of politics and um, experiences into other kinds of uh, coalitions. But I don't think the academy uh, is this kind of imagined uh, place of um, ideas and, and culture uh, is the basis upon uh, which we would foment you know, political uh, struggle. I think that um, people who work um, uh, within the academy need to come into these struggles as people who are engaged uh, in political struggle. And like with any kind of coalition, uh, then it is about figuring out what our uh, overlapping and mutual interests are, what is the foundation upon which we try to build uh, a kind of meaningful uh, solidarity um, and that is the basis upon which we uh, struggle uh, together. Um, and so I think that that is, is really in some ways an approach to um, bringing together the, the various um, uh, uh, struggles that we're uh, engaged with, because there, there's actually quite a bit happening uh, and going on. And, you know, part of the, the challenge is how do we build mass movements that um, bring the different areas, different sectors uh, together, not in a way to diminish a particular struggle. So we're not trying to come together on the least, you know, what is the least common denominator? What is the one thing that we can all agree on while we kind of dampen the other things that we might disagree uh, on, but solidarity is about how do we um, connect on the need to, to to struggle, and it means that we have, you know, there are different things that we are fighting around um, that are are important, and what connects us, um, and you know, how do we really absorb and adopt the idea that an injury to one um, is an injury to all, and so this has also been. Uh, part of the uh, impediment uh, to building, you know, a strong left. And and Robin writes, you know, quite um, uh, clearly, importantly, passionately about this in in Freedom Dreams by looking at the various iterations of of struggle, both in terms of uh, historically the the socialist and and Marxist movement and its relationship uh, to black workers. Uh, the struggle of black women uh, to find uh, their place within uh, social movements um, when many movements have, you know, uh, tried to sort of marginalize uh, the issues around which black women um, come together and, and mobilize. Um, and, you know, how, how do, are we conceiving of building movements um, that don't ask people to leave parts of themselves uh, behind? Um, but understand that, you know, the space has to be created um, for the entirety uh, of our uh, oppressions and marginalizations to be brought into the arena uh, of struggle, that other people must come to understand their centrality, that we don't discard them uh, to create comfortable spaces uh, of, of struggle for others, but that we include them uh, to broaden our horizons um, and to unite and connect with each other um, on a much stronger and solid basis and commitment. Right. Yeah, you know, um, thanks for those kind words, <laughs> by the way. Um, the last thing I wanted to say was, you know, which is actually tied to both that question and the question you posed earlier, and also everything you just said uh, about what it means to create more robust, larger, mass movements that can, you know, that can build power. And I have to say, and I'm curious about your your take on this, and this is how we're going to end, is I've been really 
impressed with with the labor with elements of the labor movement right now, uh, which is very different from the nineteen nineties. I mean, you know, there, there's there, but I think about um, SEIU. I just was in a meeting with with some SEIU uh, uh, comrades, but you know, the unions for all campaign unite here. Local eleven is doing this really great worker education. Uh, there's uh, the su- Southern Worker Program from the Southern Workers Assembly. Um, and the, we, right here in LA, you know, um, we have uh, the successful le- election of Lola Smallwood Cuevas, who is a you know, leader mm. and founder of the Los Angeles Black Worker Center, National Nurses United. So these are all unions that basically said exactly what you said, that we cannot build solidarity by telling our telling the working class that somehow the things that they need to leave everything behind because it doesn't make any sense just logically when you think about what is the constant what constitutes difference within working class well difference isn't always like i i like chitlins and you know or, or i'm a vegetarian difference is you get treated differently by racism um, you get treated differently by the fact, by the, the denial of reproductive rights. So it's so the, the fact that it matters that it's an attack on the class. Racism yeah. is an attack on the class. The denial of reproductive rights, attack on the class. The denial of voting rights, an attack on the whole class. So we don't, we actually don't want difference. <laughs> we, we want to eliminate those things that produce differential um, power to build worker power. And I think that people are really coming around to that in a way that I've never seen before. And I'm very, very excited about it. And they've made us, they have made us do it. They have made us do it. I mean, this is part to me, this is part of the opening that was was crashed through with Occupy mm-hmm. Wall Street right. in 2000, you know, 2010, 2011. And we are still in that moment. We have not retreated from uh, that moment. And in fact, it has become even more intense. The the free market capitalism and the horrific levels of inequality and exploitation that go on in American society that have captured white workers, right? Like in ways that can no longer be, uh, can no longer be denied. And so the whole deaths by despair, right? Like ordinary working class people, life expectancy gone into reverse. This does not happen in the developed world, right? And why is it gone into reverse? Dr- opioid addiction, alcoholism, and suicide, right? This is this is what is happening to white working class people. And now it is, there is a talk about, well, this was happening with them and maybe things were improving for black workers. No, it was white workers meeting black workers on the way down and now, it's happening to the entire American working class. The life expectancy of ordinary people in this country across the board has gone into reverse. And no, it's not COVID. It's a, COVID is one part of it, but it is drug addiction, alcoholism, suicide, loneliness, sadness, depression. These are all the a kind of solidarity of, of sadness uh, between the different uh, um, sections. Uh, of the American working class. And so those are the beginnings of the discussion uh, of what, you know, a foundation uh, of solidarity uh, could look like. And it's part of the reason why the Republicans have become so hysterical and vociferous in their espousal of racism. Uh, Because racism for the political class, the elite, have never just been about racism unto itself, right? Is always coupled with a, a political program. It is always in response to the awakening of class consciousness. And when you're talking about the reversal of life expectancy, that is 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 the that is about class consciousness and people saying, well, whose life expectancy has gone into reverse? Because it's not everyone's life expectancy. It's some people. And so the response to that, I mean, this is Trump, right? It's the Mexicans, the Muslims, and the and the and the blacks that are the problem, while we have this massive transference of wealth. 
And it's the same thing now, right? The billionaires became bigger billionaires through the pandemic. And then what do they have to talk about coming out of the pandemic? Oh, it's crime, right? It's the border. It's all of these things, except that somehow billionaires became even richer through a period of historic levels of crisis and disease and unemployment. You just those two things are, are always connected uh, uh, to each other. And so they have made these connections palatable, plausible, seeable, visible. They, they are on the, the, the surface of things. And that's why, and in part, I think the 2020 protests were so big and so powerful. And it brought all these people out because everyone was feeling some aspect of what it means to be left behind right, and what right. it means to be left out. Exactly. And so that to me is a reason for, for optimism. Um, it, it's the reason, I mean, it, it's terrible, but it, it's the reason why I think that these contradictions with American capitalism have never been clearer. And that's why you have, you, if we just went by the polls of like what people in this country actually wanted, it would be a totally different conversation because people want universal health care, right? People want the state to play a role in helping to house people, you know, but we, we are governed by millionaires. The U.S. Congress, everyone in the Senate is a millionaire. In the House of Representatives, the average wealth is $990,000. Mm-hmm. They're almost millionaires. So we are, the, the median income for white people in this country is $74,000. For black people, it's $47,000. And we can talk about that disparity. But this part of the problem, when you only talk about the disparity between that, you miss the really big disparity right. between who rules us and the ordinary person, or Jeff Bezos and the ordinary person. And who's going to deal with that disparity? So we can get caught up on the racial wealth gap. And it's important to talk about because it is a tangible expression of racism in our society. But if you think that the only objective is to create some more wealthy black people and to close the racial wealth gap, then you're missing this whole other thing that is happening over here that is having a devastating impact, not just on the lives of, of, of individual workers, but is destroying the planet. It's mm-hmm. destroying everything around us. So this this is an opening, and I think an opportunity um, for the left to uh, regenerate itself, to become relevant, um, and to you know play a meaningful role in the 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 next uh, wave of struggles that are, in my opinion, inevitable. Well, Kanga, it's you know you are you are one of the main people on in this country and on the planet, you know, in that fight right now, and you you are like the perfect person to both talk about and create help create that opening. So I still appreciate and, and honored to be in this conversation with you, and you remind me that um, you know racism, you know, the term we used to use back in the day. Remember this? We used to call it reaction. <laughs> is reaction to yes. the potential class power. And I just that's an old term that we got to bring back. It's a reaction to. Yeah. Because we cannot live, we cannot accept this idea that somehow it's just a fixed structure that never changes. And it's right. just, you know, it's not going to change. So anyway, thank you, you know, for doing all this work, for being the person you are and uh, for fighting that fight. So, you know, and I'm telling everyone... Get your subscription or put your name in the in the thing to get Hammer and Hope. Read it and and, and act. So. And get Freedom Dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that too. <laughs> Sorry, Anthony. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we're saying farewell. Thank you so much, and we and, and I'll see you in in LA soon. Yes. Okay, take care. Ciao. Bye. <laughs>